वेलकम टू इपीजी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर मृणमय प्रामाणिक आई टीच कम्पेटिव इंडियन लैंगुएज एंड लिटरेचर एट द यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ कैलकाटा नाउ उल डिसकस मॉड्यूल टुएल्व ऑफ द पेपर ट्रांसलेशन स्टडीज एंड दैट इज ट्रांसलेशन एज री राइटिंग द कंटेंट ऑफ दिस मॉड्यूल इज रिटन बाय रिया रॉय चौधरी दैट मेरियम वेबस्टर्स डिक्शनरी डिफेंस ट्रांसलेशन as words that have been changed from one language into a different language or the act of process of translating something into a different language or the act of process of changing something from one form into another in more technical terms translation is the act of communicating a source language text into a target language derived from the latin word translatio translation is the act of bringing across ideas from different cultures and backgrounds due to the global diversity translation has been an essential means of communication amongst people who come from diverse cultures religions regions or races in other words it has become one of the basic needs of man Andre Lefebvre proposed the idea of translation as rewriting. Lefebvre's conception of translation was the notion of regarding translation as a form of rewriting was first developed by Andre Lefebvre, who perceived translation as a process carried out under the influence of particular categories and norms constitute to system in a society. The most important of these are patronage ideology politics and the universe of discourse translation has never been an activity which takes place in a isolation it emerges out of a context or a historical background following which a text is target text translated from one language into another Translation often has a purpose such as that of cultural enrichment or serving the literary demands of the of a target audience. In this case, it becomes difficult for the translator to serve his purpose and simultaneously maintain fidelity to the original. For instance, when a foreign text is translated for the domestic audience, the translator has to keep the domestic needs into consideration. This notion of influencing the readers is also propagated by Lefebvre who states that rewriting is the adaptation of a work of literature to a different audience with the inter intention of influencing the way in which that audience reads the work the rewriting of the translation of Victor Hugo's Les Miserables by Munip Pasha which was translated into a turkish newspaper serial forms a crucial example a huge amount of suspense was maintained for the readers till the next issue which not only increased the readership of the audience and helped in the growth of journalism in the reformation period of the 19th century of the ottoman empire but also served the purpose of entertaining the readers to go into deeper of the translation theory proposed by Andrew Lefebvre which is popularly known as translation as rewriting um, we have to see the background or the history of development of translation theory so let us talk about Dryden's notion on translation in order to understand the notion of translation as rewriting we should first analyze some of the basic theories of translation as I told, as proposed and propagated by a number of authors, scholars and academicians. Perhaps the oldest amongst them is John Dryden, who has often been referred to as the theorist of translation. His major works in translation appear in the prefaces and dedications of certain literary works as Ovid's Epistles in 1680, Silvae 1685, the satires of Juvenal and Persuis, 1692, Datus, 1693, Examine Poeticum, 1693, Virgil's Ennius, 1697, 
Fables Ancient and Modern, 1700, and the works of Lucian, 1711. In his preface to Ovid's epistles, Dryden proposed a tripartite division of the theory of translation, which includes metaphors, which is translating a work from word to word and line by line from one language to another, and translating a work from word to word and line by line from one language to another, paraphrase, in which though the author is taken into consideration, his work is not followed from uh, word to word and is subject to exaggeration, if not alteration and imitation, in which the translator takes freedom in changing both the word and its meaning and uses the source text only to derive an idea or a hint. Both metaphrase and imitation have been rejected on the grounds that the former provide renderings that are unidiomatic and obscure, while the later renders too much liberty in the hands of the translator and seem more like original compositions and not translated versions. Therefore, paraphrase was the most celebrated of all the divisions as it brought balance between the two extremes which were both impractical and unwelcoming. For the most part of his translating career, Dryden followed the paraphrasic style. However, he uh, sometimes incorporated metaphrase and imitation as per the demand of his literary work. He adopts metaphrase in his translation of Lucretius when he elucidates the Roman poet's Vitae Fossa, the lacuna that exists when the structure of atoms composing an individual human being is dissolved in death as pause of life. On the other hand, in Ovid's Art of Love and Juvenal Satyrs, Dryden takes a lot from the source text and relates it in context of contemporary London, thereby applying the method of imitation. However, uh, the fact that imitation provides a lot of scope for rewriting cannot be denied. One of the best examples of this in the contemporary times is witnessed in the script of the Bollywood blockbuster, Haidar, imitating William Shakespeare's Hamlet. Vishal Varadwaj changes the setting from El Sinore, Denmark to Kashmir, India and goes on to depict the age-old problem of territorial conflict between India and Pakistan. A similar form of rewriting can also be found in the script of Gurinder Chandra's Bride and Prejudice, the rewriting of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, in which the 19th century England has been replaced by the locals of contemporary Amritsar. Now let us talk about Sklamacher's notion of the definition of different methods of translation. Frederick Daniel Ernst Sklamacher in his essay Uber the Varsius Denen Methoden des Uber Setzens on the different methods of translation 1813 states that there remains an unabridged gap between the language of the source text and the translator's home language which makes translation an extremely difficult task and is detrimental in reproducing the meaning faithfully, which should be the primary goal of a translator. Sklamacher claims that when a translator deals with an alien language, he attempts to paraphrase the author's notion into his own language in the process of which he gradually begins overlooking the original intention of the original author. The inevitable consequence is rewriting. Sklamacher also points out the difficulties involved especially in case of translating poetry, emphasizing upon the fact that when poetry is translated, not only its explication but its musical aspect including rhyme schemes and meter are needed to be reproduced as well. And sometimes the word which fits the most into the rhyme scheme or is compatible with the meter might not be the one which reproduces the exact meaning. 
In order to cope with this difficulty of translating, the translator must have a hermeneutical expertise. Another way is to bring the reader into the world of the original linguistic version of the author. That is to mold the language as much possible into that of the original. In order to communicate as per as possible an impression of the system of concepts developed in it. In other words, he must valorize the foreign and convert it into target language. As a consequence, if the translator desires to communicate to his readers the same impression that he received from the source text, the reader must also possess the same amount of education and understanding as him or her. Also, there is a requisite for a special language of translation which is able to convey the expression of the foreign. But all these conditions are difficult to be fulfilled by every translator, often resulting into a recreation of the original. Benjamin's view on the task of the translator is quite significant to get into the things of translation as a rewriting. An experimental view of translation is adopted by Walter Benjamin in his 1923 essay that this over the czars, translated into English by Harry Zone as the task of the translator in 1969. The essay originally was an introduction to Benjamin's own German translation of Baudelaire's Tableaucus Parisians. However, it gradually emerged as one of the seminal philosophical texts on literary translation. Benjamin discusses that the purpose of translation is not to render meaning to or a better understanding of the original text. Rather, translation exists separately, though in communion with the original as its afterlife, simultaneously providing it with a continued life. Benjamin states that a good translation expresses the reciprocal relationship between languages. It expresses the inherent relationship between two languages, not by referring back to the original, but by uh, creating a harmony between two languages. In the words of Walter Benjamin, a real translation is transparent. It does not cover the original does not block its light but allows the pure language as though reinforced by its own medium to shine upon the original all the more fully. This may be advised above all by a literal rendering of the syntax which proves words rather than uh, sentences uh, to be the uh, primary uh, element of the translator. Nida's theory of equivalence also is uh, quite significant to understand our topic. Eugene Nida defines two types of equivalence. While formal equivalence is the rendering of the exact meaning, dynamic equivalence is the passing forward of the equivalent effect of the message. In order to meet the end, the translator should have to prioritize in mind the first being the priority of the hard language over the written language especially during translation of such tales or scriptures which the audience has not read but have been hearing in oral form since ages and it, um, such kind of text includes uh, fairy tales and um, fables, uh, moral stories and such kind of text. The second priority should be the needs of the audience over the forms of the language. This priority means that the forms understood and accepted by the audience to whom a translation is directed are more significant than the forms which may respect a long literary tradition. Dynamic equivalence, however, has not been well accepted by everybody in the history of translation. Often the translator has been called a traitor and has been accused of altering meanings of the source text in his translated version. It is not always possible to interpret layers of meanings in literary pieces such as poetry and simultaneously keeping the syntax and the structure intact. 
A translation should be successful if it can retain the aesthetic appeal and pleasure of the source language, even if the process involves a bit of alteration or transcreation. And those who believe in untranslatability are mostly the ones who either consider the source text to be a sacred thing or the ones who are too strict regarding the structure, grammar and syntax of the target language. But the fact which should be taken into consideration is that cultural disparity between two languages will always exist and that is why uh, untranslatability happens. For instance, words expression of interjections like Mahua, Sher o Shairi, Haire Dayan which exclusively reflect the culture of the Orient cannot be translated in English keeping alive the exact cultural value. Besides the availability of a word in the target language bearing the exact same meaning cannot always be expected. Lawrence Fenuti in his book The Translator's Invisibility touches upon the history of translation across the ages. He claims that domesticated practices have led to the invisibility of the translator. According to him, due to legal and cultural constraints, only a faithful rendition of translation, which is actually an illusion of transparency, is accepted. Consequently, any sort of experimental translation fails to receive ready acceptance from publishers and a large scale of Anglophone readers who read to satiate their immediate intelligibility. Thus, the most important criteria of translation tends to be fluency, while all other alterations and foreignness are purposely erased. The translator tends to translate the source text into fluent English in order to make the target text more accessible and readable, thereby creating an illusion of transparency. Now, uh, let us talk about rewriting other than translation. As pointed out by Lefebvre, rewriting do not consist only of translations. Any sort of reference work, historiography or even criticisms form a part of rewriting. In other words, rewriting establishes the very identity of a writer, author and also that of the target culture. All the rewriting, whatever their intention, reflect a certain ideology and poetics and as much manipulate literature to function in a given society in a given way. Thus, rewriting is also a manifestation of the controlling powers of a society. We might say that Lefebvre makes an attempt to create an impression of the foreign author before the target culture and also to expose the controlling mechanisms by means of which the foreign image is changed in a literary system. On a positive note, rewriting can introduce new thoughts, beliefs and components into a society. For instance, the hexameter was introduced into German poetry through the Homer translation of John Hendrik Voss. John Hockham Fries translation of Louis Guy Pulsey reintroduced Ottawa Rima into English literature, where it was soon picked up by Byron and masterfully used in Don Juan. Refraction Lefebvre uses a term called refraction to denote rewriting a text in a manner that will be accepted by the audience targeted. This may result either into a complete metamorphosis of the original or a very little change. The change may either be of the language of the original, the ideology of the original or of the poetics of the original. Lefebvre also talks about the resistance of patronage under which the task of translation is undertaken. These resistance may might be political, cultural, ideological or economic in context of the la target culture. Now, uh, <clears throat> we can find the similar kind of conception in Indian translation culture also. If we see the history of Indian translation practice, we can find the Indian translation of medieval era, Indian translation of Bhakti period especially, Indian translation of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata which happened uh, uh, since 
the medieval period and happened mostly in medieval period in in different indian languages are actually the retelling translation theorists like indranath choudhury sujit mukherjee ganesh devi tejashini niranjana all these people uh, accepted the mode of translation in india especially in medieval period is necessarily retelling and when ak ramanujan talks about 300 ramayana he also hinted the retelling way of translating indian classics and indian puranas and indian mahakavyas in modern indian languages as far as translation in india concerned the oral voice and the folklores played a crucial role when we see the translation of the ramayana and the mahabharata we can find that those translation of ramayana and mahabharata not only from the balmiki's ramayana or the vedavyasa's mahabharata the uh, translation of the ramayana mahabharata in modern indian languages are from multiple sources and those sources are balmiki's ramayana vedavyasa's mahabharata and the ram katha and mahabharat katha which existed in the oral tradition for long time in indian culture the retelling of these folk tales and tales of past glory over the ages inspired the authors and poets to write literary pieces of their own for instance the folk uh, alahas of madhya pradesh inspired the hindi a poetess shubhadra kumari chauhan to write one of her most famous poem jhansi ki rani here in india the glory of mainstream literature rest not by marginalizing but by accepting oral or folk or loka as complementary retelling might be referred to as a means of keeping alive the history of a place through reiteration of its past events in oral form but in indian context oral tribal or folklore are not merely the residue of the past but methods of continuing and enriching the present however retelling differs from rewriting in the fact that rewriting cannot take place without the presence of a written text it is the written which is sup supposed to be rewritten now let us conclude our discussion saying this uh, therefore we can infer that translation is a process which involves a socio cultural exchanges and transportation certain purposes are served in the process of translation as it operates in a complex literary and socio cultural milieu in order to meet these purposes translation often takes the form of rewriting which takes place following all the restraints set by the patronage in the society as understood rewriting involves a lot of manipulation as the translator has to mold it according to the needs of the target audience however the contribution made by translations in the literary genres are no less than original compositions lawrence venuti acknowledges the powerful influence of the translators over the society the preserve and enrich the target literature enhance trust understanding and respect between different cultures languages and ideologies thereby encouraging the globalizing goals of the contemporary times in the recent years the concept of transcreation has emerged which allows ample freedom to the translator during his act when the term was first used in 1960s and 1970s its usage was primarily restricted to describe the translation of creative advertisement copies but if we see the translation as uh, transcreation is already practiced in indian translation culture since the ancient period uh, now it is also believed by some that the term has its roots in the computer and video games markets in 1980s but from the world of advertisements and sales markets the concept of transcreation gradually got transferred into the arenas of literature one of the modern instances of transcreation would be the the internationally acclaimed young adult series of harry potter by jk rowling 
the words names and spells that determine the world of fantasy in rowling will not make sense if translated word to word this has provided a vast scope for transcreation the school of wizardry and witchcraft named hogwarts has become pox the lord in french in its french counterpart which literally means bacon lies ravenclaw becomes sir eagle which means eagle talon and hufflepuff become puffsofl meaning out of puff transcreation is essentially a method of rewriting which helps the translator to project his proficiency as a writer this emerging trend of uh, rewriting the original has helped translation studies to carve its own niche in the literary market and evolve as an independent discipline out of the discipline of comparative literature that is originally formed a part of thank you